Hey guys, welcome to our service. I'm so glad that you're tuning in today. If you didn't know, Church on the Move is a family of churches. We have three locations across Northeast Oklahoma. So if you live near one of our locations, come out and join us in person. We have incredible worship and teaching, and of course, amazing environments for kids and students that we want you and your family to experience for yourselves. If you have questions, you can drop a comment below or visit churchonthemove.com for more info. Now enjoy the service. A deeper relationship with God is possible for every single person in this room this year. And, and for some of you, for some of you, that means really kind of taking that, that first step that you have pretty much zero relationship with God. And I believe that you can move towards him and, and have a relationship with him. Uh, for some of you, it, it may be that you've kind of, you've been on cruise control for months or years or whatever it may be. And it's time for you to say, man, what would it look like for me to, to seriously follow after Jesus, and for some of you, and man, you're the, you're the story of your long obedience in the same direction, right? You, you've been faithful, you've been following after God, and that's beautiful, uh, but we do not finish until we're standing in the presence of our Father. And so what does it look like for you to continue to grow in your relationship with God? And, and so wherever you're at on that spectrum, here's, here's what I want you to know. Here's just the, the basic thing that I wanna try to instill into our minds today. It's something I hope you think about through this year is that you are fully equipped to follow Jesus this year. You're fully equipped. There is nothing that you are lacking there's nothing that you're waiting on. There's nothing you don't have. You have everything you need to fully follow Jesus this year. There's this book in our Bible. It's called 1 Corinthians. Paul's writing to this church in Corinth. If you've read the book of Corinthians, you may know this, but the, the church in Corinth was a mess, okay? They were a disaster. Paul's writing to say, hey, quit doing that stuff. That's wrong. Hey, you asked this question. Let me tell you what's up. He is, there's a lot of stuff that Paul, in, in fact, he's got to write a second letter, okay? So there's a lot going on in Corinthians. More often, they, they looked like the culture, more like the culture than they did uh, the church, the bride of Christ. And at, at times, there's actually some issues where they looked worse than the culture. Like they were doing stuff and Paul's like, hey, they don't even do that. Guys, like, come on, let's, let's reel it in here. And so I want to read, um, we're going we're gonna to move through a lot of verses today, but I want to read out of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, because I, I think uh, some of what Paul gets to in this chapter, I think is helpful for us as we think about faithfully following Jesus this year. And where does Paul start when he's, he's talking to a church that's just a complete disaster? He starts by, by telling them a little history lesson. He says, hey, um, you know, there was, uh, there, there was this nation of Israel. There was God's chosen people. If you read uh, the Old Testament, uh, you know, he's like, hey, there was the, the God's people. They were down in the land of Egypt. They were in slavery. And God uses Moses. And Moses brings them out of the land. Maybe you've heard these stories before. There's the plagues. They cross the sea. He takes them. They're supposed to go immediately to the promised land. They mess up. So they spend some time out in, in what they call the wilderness and kind of in this waiting period until they go into the promised land. And so he begins with reminding his church, this church in Corinth, about this story. Now, here's how he says it. He says, For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Now, the cloud he's talking about is there was a cloud by day that guided them, and there was a fire at night that, that led them, and then they went through the sea, which is the dramatic, you know, Charlton Heston movie, right? They go through the sea, and then the, the waves crash down. And they were all baptized into Moses and the cloud and the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all ate the same spiritual drink. And, and he's referring here to there was times when they needed food. And so every single day, God would rain this stuff called manna down. It was this bread-like kind of wafer thing. And that's how God fed them in the wilderness. And then they said, hey, we want meat. And so he brought a whole bunch of quail and they woke up and there's quail all over the ground. And then there was times that they needed water. And so God provided water. There's times that there was water and it was water that was bitter. They couldn't drink. And so God made it this drinkable water. So uh, Paul is saying, hey, you remember he provided food for them. He provided water for them. And he says, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. And the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, <laughs> Though all these miraculous things happen, with most of them, God was not pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. And that's where they mess up and they have to stay in the wilderness. This, this whole generation has to stay there and they don't get to enter into the land because of their disobedience. Now, a couple interesting things about how Paul starts here. 
is first of all, he, he's telling his story. He says, hey, remember your fathers. Um, but this happened generations and generations ago. In, in fact, the people that mess up, they died in the wilderness before he let the next one go. So it's like, we're talking generations and generations. And so these aren't their fathers. And we... I mean, he's, you know, it's the idea of like, hey, these are your forefathers, but Paul's writing to this church in Corinth, and this church in Corinth is filled with Jews who would have been from the nation of Israel, but it's also filled with Gentiles who had, they had no, you know, connection to this family, to this, this thing that God had done through Abraham. They were completely outside of the chosen family of God, and they had come into the church because Jesus now made a way for everybody to be together in the church. But he said, he told them, your fathers. And what Paul's doing here is he's saying, hey, uh, this story, the story that you know about Egypt, this is our story. And we should, he even noticed the language that he uses. He, he says that, um, that our fathers, they were all in the cloud and they all passed through the sea and they were all baptized. They all ate the same. He's like, hey, I want you to, to think about them and, and put yourself into the story that you are one of them in this story. And so for you and I reading this today, we should say, okay, well, well I'm, a, I'm a Gentile drafted into the family of God because of what Jesus did. So therefore, this is, this is my story as well, that, that I should pay attention to what happened with Moses, that I should learn to them who went before me. And, and as we read in verse five, they weren't, they weren't faithful. So he goes on, verse six, he said, now these things took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. Paul's saying, hey, we should, we should learn from their mistakes. Right? We should not repeat what those who have gone before us have done. I'm the youngest of uh, three boys. So I have a, a brother who is six years older than me, a brother who is four years older than me. Um, we joked about how I'm the best kid, but it's also kind of like we joked because there's like truth to it, you know, that uh, <laughs> I'm not saying mom loved me more. I'm just saying I was the easiest, all right, of the three of us. And I can tell you, I, I don't have any like, specific memories of like choosing this or thinking this. It's just something that as I reflect upon my childhood and my relationships with my brother, it's something that's kind of in my brain is I just, I, I just I remember always kind of having the idea of watching, specifically my oldest brother, uh, watching him make decisions, do things, right? And then watching the results of that. Yeah, watching uh, you know, whether it was dad yelling at him, him losing privileges, him getting sent to his room, whatever it is. And I just remember, even from a young age, just going, okay, that didn't work, right? Like, I, I should not repeat that because that did not get the results that I want, right? That is not, and so I avoided a lot of things because my brother did them. And I thought, well, that doesn't, that doesn't seem to be a very good idea, right? We should learn from those who go before us. And, and here's what we often talk about and following Jesus is that it's because of our faith, it's because of our relationship with Jesus, and out of that flows our obedience. Out, out of that flows our behavior. And that is completely true, and I preach that, and I will continue to preach that. But I also think, I also think that in, in the way God's system works, that the opposite can be true as well. So I think sometimes when you just start doing the things you're supposed to do, <laughs> And when you start reading and saying, okay, God says I should do this. When you say, well, they did that and they messed up and I'm gonna do the opposite. When we start doing what God tells us to do, I, I think that can begin to do a transforming work in our heart. And then all of a sudden now we have this, this overflowing that then leads to obedience and it's out of this place. I, I think sometimes that, that our obedience can lead to faith. And, and Paul's saying, hey, pay attention to those who went before you. And then to the verse I really wanted to get to this morning. So if you sleep through the rest, pay attention to this one. This is the first verse I remember. Actually, I talked to our, uh, our 180 students a few weeks ago, and this is the, Shane said, hey, use your favorite verse or favorite story, and this is the one that I chose because I remember as a middle school, high school student reading this verse, and, and, and this was the first verse I chose to memorize. Besides, like, you know, for God so loved the world, this was one that, like, I read, and I thought, this seems important. Like, I, I think this is something that I need in my toolbox as I'm trying to follow Jesus. This is something that I need to pay attention to, that I need to know about. This is what Paul tells the church, reflecting on this story of failure in the wilderness. He says, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. And God is faithful. And he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability 
But with temptation, it will come. He will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. You know, often what people say is, uh, they'll quote, they'll, they think they're quoting the Bible and they'll say that God will never give you more than you can handle. You can't find that verse in the Bible. Somebody was talking about it to me a couple weeks ago. They said, hey, they said that. Is that? I'm like, no, it's not, it's not really in there. What is in there is that God will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. Uh, that God will not cause you to sin. That every time you face temptation, there's a way out. You know the old phrase, like the devil made me do it, it doesn't line up with scripture, all right? Like God says, when you face temptation, there is a way for you to escape that and to move toward God and, and, and to move in the direction that he desires for you. And then he says, hey, everything you're facing is common to mankind. Basically, you're not special, right? Like everything you're facing, somebody else is facing that. Now things have changed over time, right? The temptation looks different than it used to, but at the root of it, it's all the same, right? It all comes down to uh, our pride and our ego. It all comes down to our desire for power. It comes down to, to sex and lust, to, to money, to selfishness, to whatever it may be, but all these things now may take the form of something you know, on your supercomputer that you carry around and we call a phone, uh, but it's the same thing that they were dealing with a long time ago. They just had a different avenue to pursue this disobedience in a different way to sin. But he's, he says, hey, what you're facing, well, it, it's not new, it's, it's not unique, and, and, and there's a way out. <laughs> you, can, you can stand up under this, you can... You, you can continue to be faithful and to live the way that God desires you to live. I, I love what he says a few verses later. He, he says this in verse 23. He says, all things are lawful. Now notice this is in quotes because Paul is quoting kind of a, a common phrase from their day. Uh, this is something like a mantra that they would have said. They'd be like, ah, you know, all things are lawful. We can do whatever we want to do. It was, you know, their version of like what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, right? Like it's all good, do what you want, but then... Paul adds on to it and he says, but hey, um, not all things are helpful. Like sure, yeah, I mean, you know, we talk about the grace of God and yeah, there's a lot of things you can do, but, but is that helpful? And then he says, all things are lawful, but not all things build up. He says, no, let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. And so Paul here, he's a, uh, He's pushing on something that you and I often do is, is we tend to ask the question, hey, is this, is this sinful or not? Can I do this? Is it, does God get mad at me if I do this or not? And how close can I get before I cross that line into sin, right? And, and, and Paul's saying, hey, maybe a better question for you to ask would be, is this helpful? Is, is this decision, this thing that I'm contemplating, is this beneficial? I wonder what our year would look like if this year, the question we asked ourselves when we faced the decision, we faced an opportunity, we were trying to decide if we wanna do something or not is, does this move me toward Jesus? And if it does, let's step in that direction. And if it doesn't, I don't want anything to do with this. Does this move me toward Jesus? My, uh, Lord help me, my, uh, my teenager got a cell phone for Christmas, okay? So we tried to set up all the parental everything that we could. And so she has to get approval to download an app. And so the other day she sent me, um, you know, she sent me the request for this app and it, it was probably age appropriate. It was just a game, but I just did, you know, I was just looking at it. And I was just like, I don't, I don't like this. It was, you know, kind of this scary, weird, creepy game. And so I, like a great dad, hit decline on that uh, request for that game. And I just said to her, I said, hey, I, it, I don't think it's wrong. I don't think it's evil. I just don't think it's beneficial. I don't think this is helpful for you. And you and I, we spend a lot of time on things that aren't, that aren't wrong, that aren't evil, but man, they are not beneficial. They are not moving us toward Jesus. And here's the other part of what Paul says is you and I, we tend to think about ourselves. Is this okay for me? Am I allowed to do this? And he says, hey, don't forget to build others up. That everything you do, you should be thinking not only is this sinful, is this okay for me, but also what impact does this have on people around me? What does this do to my family? What's this do to, the, to my community? What's this do to my church? Is this building others up? Is this beneficial for them, yes or no? Is this helpful for them? 
Yes or no, we, we should ask ourselves, does this move others toward Jesus? If it does, let's step in that direction. If it, if it doesn't, let's not do that. Now, you may be like, that sounds, sounds great, Ryan. I love it. I wanna move towards Jesus this year. But remember like 10 minutes ago when we talked about all the things we've tried and we failed and it's hard. And so here's what I wanna do is I just wanna point out three things that as, as I was studying through Corinthians, I just, they seemed to, to pop out to me. Three, three things that I, I believe that if we keep in, in front of us, that if we remember, uh, that we'll remember that God has fully equipped us with everything we need to faithfully follow after Jesus this year. So the first thing is you have Jesus before you. You have Jesus, but Jesus has already come. Jesus has already lived for you. He has gone to the cross for you. He has been resurrected for you. This has already happened. Now, when you read the words of Paul, everything that Paul talks about, everything Paul says, it's through the lens of Jesus. Paul had a dramatic experience when he came face to face with God on the road to Damascus. And from that point forward, every single decision in Paul's life was through the filter of who is Jesus and how did he live and what did he say and what's his instruction for the church. And in fact, if we were to flip to the, the first chapter of Corinthians, just from the beginning, this is what Paul says. He says in, in uh, verse 23, he says, but we preach Christ crucified. He's like, hey, Corinthians, this is what we do. We're gonna talk about Jesus because everything we do is about Jesus and about what he has done for us. When we're getting to the end of the letter, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, this is what he says in the, the 14th verse. This is one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible. He says, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. It's like, if the resurrection didn't happen, guys, it's pointless. Go out and party, go do whatever you wanna do because it doesn't matter if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead. And so as Paul is talking to this church, everything is about Jesus. It's, hey, guys, uh, here's how the church should be structured and here's why. It's because Jesus is the head of the church. And hey, guys, we take communion and here's why we take communion because Jesus showed us how to take communion. Hey, guys, you've been given spiritual gifts and here's why, because Jesus said that he was gonna give you something greater whenever you left. Hey, guys, like everything is around Jesus. So, so why as a church do we today, why do we get together and sing songs? Because we wanna be reminded of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. I had a moment today singing this morning where I was singing words, and I don't know if this ever happens to you, this happens to me, where I'm singing words, I go, do I believe this or not? Like it, it puts me in a moment of like, man, this is a pretty bold claim about who God is and about what he's done. Do I believe this? And that's a good moment for me to say, okay, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna proclaim this with my mouth because I, I think this is true. We, we gather and we sing because of that. Uh, why do we take communion? Because it's remembering what Jesus did for us on the cross. Why do we do baptism, which we'll be doing in February, where we dunk people underwater and bring them back up? Why do we do that? Because Jesus set the example for us and Jesus told us to go and to, to reach people and to baptize people. Everything we do, just as Paul was trying to start the Corinthians, is because of Jesus, that Jesus has gone before us. And, and what would it look like for you this year as you're making this decisions to say, man, what does God desire for me? What does God desire for my family? What does God desire for me as an employee? What does God desire? How, how do we keep just who Jesus is and what he did and what he said in front of us so that we can try to faithfully follow after him this year? Now, the second thing you have is you have the spirit of God inside you. This is maybe the most important one. Does, does Jesus said, hey, I'm gonna give you an incredible gift. When I leave, this is, this is more important than me being here. You are gonna get the presence of God inside of you. That you are, the Bible says you are a temple and the spirit of God lives inside you. We're told that if you're a believer, that you have been given the spirit to be with you. And, and 1 Corinthians is, is uh, there's a whole chapters where, where Paul's talking about spiritual gifts and what are spiritual gifts and what do they look like? And we are not diving into any of that <laughs> this morning. That's a, that's a huge, huge topic. But I do wanna read just one verse when Paul's kind of in, in the midst of talking about all this. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he says, all these are empowered by one spirit and the same spirit who apportions to each individually as he wills. 
So what's Paul saying here? He's saying uh, that, uh, that the God who created you, the God who knows you better than anybody knows you, he is the one, his spirit is the one who's choosing what gifts you need. The one who knows you in the most intimate, deepest way possible is saying, hey, this is, this is what they need. This is, this is the gift or these are the gifts that I'm going to give to them. To say it the way we've been talking this morning is you are, you are fully equipped because God has given you the exact gifts that you need to faithfully follow after him right now, this year. So we have Jesus before us. We have the Holy Spirit inside of us. And then you have the family of God alongside you. It's perfect today that we're just in one service as Chad kind of joked. There's probably people that you don't know because they come at a different time or a different day than you do to service. Um, but, but us gathering, it matters. The, the very next verse when Paul's talking about spiritual gifts, verse 12, he says, for just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Now, this is a, a pretty radical little, little couple verses here because Paul, I mean, just imagine their context. He's saying, hey, it doesn't matter if you're Jewish. It doesn't matter if you're Greek. It doesn't matter if you're male, you're female, you're, your social economic background. It doesn't matter if you're a slave or free. All of us together have been made one, we've been unified in the body of Christ. And their house churches, man, what a beautiful picture their churches were as these people gathered together from all these different walks of life and imagine the tension in the room sometimes as they were brought together by the only thing that unified them was Jesus. And you were meant to do life, you're meant to follow after Jesus alongside others. This is not an individual practice. This is something you're meant to, we, we've been saying this for the last year is spiritual growth happens best in Christ-centered relationships over a long period of time, that you're meant to walk alongside others in your faith. And that's why being here today is so important. That's why this matters. That's why we're here on the first to doing this church thing because showing up and, and being alongside others who are moving in the same direction, it's important. And if you're, if you're watching this and it's a couple days later and you're watching on YouTube, we love you and maybe you're out of town or had something going on, but, but for all of us, hey, would, would you say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it a priority this year to get to the weekend to be with my church family. We've got a Saturday night at five o'clock. We've got Sunday morning at 9.15, 11.15. Find a time, make it a priority, put it on the calendar. It's not negotiable, all right? Unless you're out of town or something. And that's not so we can have great attendance numbers. That's not so we can feel good as pastors as we get to preach to a full room. That's because it, it matters that you're alongside people that are moving in the same direction that you're moving. It's why every single week we stand up and we talk about things like next move. Chad did it today, Next Move. I can do it in my sleep, guys. Hey, we invite you to Next Move. You're gonna hear about who we are, where we're headed, and how you can be a part of it. You'll hear directly from our senior pastor, Seth. Like, I can do the whole thing because we say it over and over. Some of you can do it because you've heard us say it every week. Why, why do we repeat it every week? Because it's important, because it matters, because we want people to get into a smaller room and sit around tables with other people that they, that they get to meet and, and meet our staff face-to-face -face and have somebody who they say, okay, I know that person. And if, if life falls apart, I'm gonna call them. I'm gonna text them. I'm gonna ask them for prayer. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get into a group and know people that way. I'm gonna serve on a team, know people that way. It's why this morning, Chad talked about groups and we're gonna talk about groups for the next few weeks. And, and I'm not gonna rehash his, his announcement because he did a great job, but I just wanna reiterate like, hey, we're starting this thing called Rooted. If you're brand new in your faith, Rooted is the perfect place to start. If you've been following Jesus for a long time, I promise it's gonna challenge you and it's gonna start some conversations that you need to be a part of. We're starting at the end of the month. Sign up, be a part of Rooted with us. We're doing a Bible study. Maybe if you're like, okay, I'm, I'm pretty good, but man, studying the Bible is hard. And, and here's, here's what I try to do in our, in our Bible studies is not just here's a bunch of great information about Exodus or whatever book we're studying. Is I want, we're, we're trying to teach you how you go home and you study the Bible. So there's homework that you do that you're supposed to fill out. And, 
And then you come together and you have to talk with other people, again, at round tables, because these relationships matter. And you, you converse and, and then you, you hear teaching and, and we try to model, hey, here's the things you should be looking at and here's the tools you should be using and here's, here's how you should, you should be doing these things. Uh, because we think these are important because, because you have the church, you have this, this family of God alongside you. And we want you to, to step in some direction. Maybe it's not a group, maybe it's a serving team, maybe it's coming to brotherhood or daughters or whatever, but we want you, we want you to, to find yourself in relationship with others. Because we think this family is a gift. And, and we think it's part of you being fully equipped to follow after Jesus this year. I was, uh, I was pulling up to the church this morning. I, I, uh, I was standing up a little bit early just to kind of go over my message, make sure my, my head was all good and in the right place. And, and there was just this beautiful, beautiful sunrise coming up over the church. And so I don't ever do this, but this morning I was like, all right, I'm gonna stop and take a picture of just the church was still had its Christmas lights on and that was the sunrise. And it's just one of those moments of like, man, first of all, God, you're so good. And man, what a wonderful creator. But it was also this sense of, you know, that you get on January 1st of like, this is a fresh start, right? We get a, we get a, a proverbial clean slate, right? We get, a, we get to start some things over. And, and I just thought about the people that would be gathering in this church today and that would be gathering in this church this year and just saying, God, I think there's some new things that you wanna do in some people. God, I think there's some people you wanna draw to yourself for the first time. There's some, some people that you wanna draw to you in a deeper a more intimate, a more loving way. But there's something that in, in each and every one of us, God wants to accomplish this year and it's starting right now. And it's available right now. You're not waiting on anything. You're not without anything. You, you are fully equipped right now to faithfully follow after Jesus this year. Church, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your good gifts. We thank you for who you are, for what you've done, for, for how you've worked. Father, we thank you that you sent Jesus for us. Father, we thank you that you didn't leave us on our own, that, that you sent your Holy Spirit for us. Father, we, we thank you that you have chosen to continue to build your kingdom and continue to work through this thing we call the church and Father, we're far from perfect and, and, and Father, we mess up and, and we're not the, the ultimate design that you would have for us. But Father, man, it's a gift. It's a gift to, to be around others who are faithfully following after you. And we thank you for that gift this morning. And I want you to just to, to keep your head, head bowed and your eyes closed and I don't know if, you know, who's shown up on a January 1st service. It's probably not your greatest time to, for guests or people who, who haven't been to church for a while, but, but I don't wanna, wanna pass the start of the year without giving people the opportunity to follow Jesus for the first time or to follow Jesus for the first time in a long time. And maybe you are showing up because you need a fresh start. Maybe you are showing up because the way you're living, the things you're trying to do isn't working and you're ready to do something else. You're ready to make Jesus the Lord and the leader of your life. You're ready to make him the king in your life. Stop trying to build your own kingdom and, and begin to be a part of his. Maybe it has nothing to do with, with my words this morning. Don't, don't worry, I, I, I'm not too confident or proud of my own abilities. Here's what I believe is is that God may have been working on you for weeks, months, and he, you finally decided to show up today. And you're making a decision that's completely unrelated to anything that's happened in this room other than God has just been pulling on you and working on you. And it's time for you to declare that you are gonna, you're gonna make him first in your life. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna pray a prayer that claims that Jesus is our Lord and our savior. And if that's the prayer that you need, if you're making that decision again for the first time ever, maybe you've strayed from church, you've strayed from relationship with Jesus, you're making that decision for the first time in a long time, I want you just to hold your hand up during the prayer. Nobody's gonna be looking around. This is just a moment for you and God to say, God, I am making this claim right now that I'm putting you first in my life. And so if that's you while I'm praying, you can raise your hand. Father, you are the Lord and the leader of my life, Father. 
I need you. My, my ways aren't working. Father, my, my path is not leading where I want it to. And Father, I am, I am making you first and foremost in my life, Father. Thank you for Jesus that he came, that he lived for me, that he died for me. Father, help me to faithfully follow after Jesus this year. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen.